Wonderful. Uh, I can't believe we are already on week six. We will be talking about clinical assessment as well as clinical medical research. And again, another further in-depth discussion of integrative approaches to healthcare and medicine. Let's begin with our slideshow. Wonderful. So again, the topics are physical assessment, integrative, complementary, and alternative healthcare. This is part two and clinical research. The first part, physical assessment, um, it's one of the most important parts of the approach. So we should start with a basic definition. A full physical assessment is also called physical examination and includes head to toe assessment and body systems assessment. It utilizes a scientific, empirical, and evidence based approach which allows the healthcare provider to identify and label patient problems, as well as potential at-risk needs. This assessment is the cornerstone of a process involving one, examination and assessment, two, diagnosis, three, planning, four, delivery implementation, and five, clinical evaluation. Something I want to mention is that in this slideshow, I will talk about the most important aspect for each of these phases, but I will also include some detailed description in the course module, again, week six, and useful websites, including other videos. So please take a look at module six. Assessment process. The healthcare provider gathers information to identify the health status of the patient. Assessments are made initially and continuously throughout patient care. This is also very important. It's not just one time, it's a continuous assessment. And we will see um, where uh, the most important elements uh, are going to be found in the first encounter with the patient, as opposed to as the continuous um, care that we need to provide to them. The remaining phases of this clinical process depend on the validity and completeness of the initial data collection. More specifically, the full assessment should include data obtained through further examination of nursing physical examination, your colleagues, PhD, MD, DO evaluation, and medical versus family history, and results of laboratory and diagnostic tests. Now we have sub elements here, um, different lists for each of these assessment. And there are differences, of course, in the typology of these assessments whether they're mostly focused on biomedical and physical elements as opposed to uh, social and psychological factors. But overall, it is important to be aware of what is going on uh, physically and otherwise in our uh, patient life, when the patient's presentation is purpose to validate a previously obtained presented diagnosis, so to make sure that this diagnosis is accurate, also to account for possible mistakes, misinterpretation, um, of other um, treatment team members. Number two, to provide scientific empirical basis for effective care. Number three, to help in the clinical decision-making process. Number four, to provide effective, integrative, and innovative nursing care. And number five, to collect data for healthcare research, including unit amelioration, improvement of care, and quality management. We will discuss the differences between qualitative and quantitative care at the end of this presentation. Uh, talking about examination, the examination process involves four main phases regarding the clinical data obtained therein. Now, we are paying special attention to uh, nursing assessment uh, in this lecture, but of course, uh, this basic uh, knowledge can be applicable throughout the healthcare system. So there are uh, four different uh, phases uh, that are called collection, so data collection, organization, data organization, validation, and documentation. So let's uh, spend a few minutes um, uh, addressing each of these uh, phases, starting with collection. So uh, data collection includes physical, psychological, that means cognitive, emotional, and behavioral aspects, ethno-sociocultural, spiritual factors that may affect client's health status. Right? So we should always be at least mindful and prepared to address these needs. It does not mean, of course, that any healthcare uh, 
recruitment team member has to be, for instance, licensed or certified in all these areas, uh, but at least having a general understanding so that we can provide a better picture to the uh, treatment team member that is indeed specialized in, for instance, psychological factors, or in the case of spiritual factors, this could be um, a pastor, rabbi, a priest, an imam, part of the uh, spiritual uh, de uh, care department in, in a public hospital, for instance, um, or a social worker and case manager in the context of uh, sociocultural factors. Uh, data collection also includes past health history of the client, the patient, a um, few examples here, allergies, uh, past surgeries, chronic diseases, um, use of uh, folk healing methods. Um, I use this term here. Now, of course, this could be controversial. We could, uh, we could address uh, this area of complementary and alternative medicine as traditional medicine, um, as um, um, traditional elements within folk medicine, etc., etc. But before we, um, we address these um, anthropological factors, I just want to mention the basic elements here, and then we'll address that um, again uh, in part two of um, this uh, PowerPoint. Current, present problems of the client, pain, nausea, sleep pattern, religious practices, medication or treatment the client is taking now, right? Also to provide uh, the best possible care when it comes to uh, when to uh, ask, for instance, for um, a prescribed medication or a PRN. For instance, we know that the client, uh, the patient, um, would like to uh, wake up earlier, for instance, um, every day to, uh, to address um, their um, spiritual, religious needs. We could schedule the first uh, medication administration maybe half an hour later than usually expected. And this also prepares us, uh, for instance, when we um, when we have to deliver information at the change of shift or right after a morning clinical round, for instance, okay? And data collection focuses mostly on three main areas, psychology, medicine, and nursing. Again, I, I, I'm not including everything here. We should include, of course, social work, spiritual care, etc., etc. But at least these three main areas should be present at least in, in, in our efforts to provide the most holistic, omnicomprehensive care to our patients. I also want to mention that those three areas are um, related, but also very much specialized. So I don't want um, students to think that, uh, for instance, uh, nursing is a, um, an easier clinical assessment in comparison to medicine. Um, it's, it's, uh, there are overlaps, of course, we're still talking about biomedical processes, but there are different uh, ways to approach that. All right, so the next uh, topic within, um, within assessment data organization, observing, interviewing, and examining. So three main areas here. Observing, to observe, is to gather data by using senses, right? So we will rely on our expertise to the direct um, um, sensory uh, inputs that we can um, observe by virtue of directly interacting with the patients. We will talk later about um, auscultation, palpation, etc. Interviewing. An interview is a planned communication or conversation with a purpose. Right? I will provide a few um, examples below, but we have to rely on the answers provided by our patient, by our client. And finally, the core uh, empirical component, examining, uh, performance of a physical examination. The physical examination is often guided, that means informed. You might have heard before of um, informed care or um, informed-based evidence, patient-informed evidence in connection to evidence-based medicine. And that's exactly what we mean by that. So, so um, a physical examination by data provided by the patient, direct um, interaction with the patient. More specifically, a head-to-toe approach is frequently used to provide systematic approach that helps to avoid omitting important data or misreading, misinterpreting previous information and or inconsistencies between reports or reporters, for instance, other treatment team members, as we previously mentioned. Continue with some methods, okay? Um, as I said, this will be a summary, but at least 
keep in mind that there are two different types of uh, data within methods, subjective and objective. We previously talked about this aspect when we uh, discuss SOAP notes within clinical notes. So in any case, uh, subjective data, within clinical notebook data are the verbal statements provided by the patient. Statements about nausea and description of pain and fatigue are examples of subjective data, where the subject, of course, is our client, our patient. Then we have objective data, signs or overt data. Those, uh, those data are detectable by an observer or can be measured or tested against an accepted standard. We will talk about telemetry and we will talk about uh, pain scales, for instance. They can be seen, heard, felt, or smelled, again, keep in mind the connection with our senses, and they are obtained by observation or physical examination. As an example here, discoloration of the skin. All right, moving on, part two, examination assessment. We talked about four phases when we were talking about data. Now we will talk about four types of assessment. Initial assessment, also called comprehensive assessment, problem focus assessment, also called focus assessment, time-lapse assessment, also called ongoing assessment, and finally, emergency assessment. Let's begin with the initial comprehensive assessment. Um, an initial assessment, also called an admission assessment, is performed when the patient enters a healthcare from a healthcare agency. Could be an inpatient unit, for instance, could be a clinic, the purpose are to evaluate the client's health status to identify functional health patterns that are problematic and to provide an in-depth comprehensive database which is critical for evaluating changes in the client's health status in subsequent assessment. Um, I use client and patient interchangeably here. Of course, we have to keep in mind a certain um, ethical components and also patient provider aspect, for instance, in the context of um, psychiatry, as we uh, briefly mentioned last week. The problem focus assessment. The problem focus assessment collects data about a problem that has already been identified. The assessment has a narrower scope and a shorter time frame than the initial assessment. In focus assessments, or problem focus assessments, the healthcare provider determines whether the problem still exists and whether the status of the problem has changed. I improved, worsened, or result. This assessment also includes the appraisal of any new, overlooked, or misdiagnosed problems. In intensive care units, the healthcare provider may perform a focus assessment every few minutes. C. Emergency assessment. Emergency assessment takes place in life threatening situations in which the preservation of life is the top priority. Time is essential in the rapid identification of and intervention for the patient's health problem. Now keep this acronym in mind, ABC. Patient's difficulties often involve A, airway, B, breathing, and C, circulatory problems. Abrupt changes in self-concept, suicidal thoughts, or roles or relationships, social conflicts leading to violent acts, can also initiate an emergency. Emergency assessment focuses on few essential health patterns and is usually not comprehensive. But then again, it is important to have this uh, broad scope of understanding, at least, that includes psychological factors, uh, biomedical factors, social factors, etc., to provide uh, the best possible care. Uh, the next one is D, time-lapsed assessment. This type of assessment is a reassessment and takes place after the initial assessment to evaluate any changes in the patient's functional health. The health provider performs time-lapse reassessment when substantial periods of time have elapsed between assessment. Uh, for instance, we have outpatient clinic visits, home health visits, health and development screening. Wonderful. So in the next slide, we'll talk about the HTT physical assessment part one. So HTT again, remember acronym that we use here. Head to toe feet. This is a um, um, summary, a brief list, uh, two parts that um, have used to um, follow this uh, module to uh, provide care to our patients. So general, uh, including general health status, vital signs of aging, and nutritional status. Mobility and self-care, things that we should do, observe posture, assess gait and balance, evaluate mobility, and 
ADLs, activities of daily living. We will talk about that in the next few slides. Head, face, and neck, evaluate cognition, LOC, orientation, mood, language and memory, sensory function, test vision, inspect, examine ears, test hearing, cranial nerves, inspect leaf nodes, and inspect neck veins. Now, of course, parts of this uh, physical assessment go beyond um, certain um, basic nursing physical assessment, but I just wanted to provide an overall um, description of all these different areas. Chest, very, very important. Inspect and palpate breasts, inspect and auscultate lungs, and auscultate hearts. Abdomen, inspect, auscultate, palpate for quadrants, palpate and percussive liver, stomach, and bladder. Bowel elimination and elimination are also a part of this assessment. All right, um, part two, skin, hair, and nails, genitalia, so inspect scalp, hair, and nails, evaluate skin turgor, observe skin lesion, assess wounds, and overall physical inspection of female versus male genitalia, and then extremities, arterial pulses, observe capillary field, evaluate edema, assess joint mobility, measure strength, assess sensory function, assess circulation, movement, and sensation, and deep tender reflexes. Continue body system assessment part one. Again, two different approaches, the HTT versus body system. A lot of things uh, should be very familiar with you. Um, um. All right, so body system assessment part one. Again, we're taking these two uh, different um, approaches, the HTT, the head to toe assessment and the body system uh, examination. A lot of these things uh, should be very familiar because we have already discussed uh, body system quite in depth. But in any case, a general presentation of symptoms, fever, chills, malaise, pain, etc., diet, appetite, um, any type of food intolerance, restrictions, allergies, what the client likes, and what type of food intake the client or patient presents um, himself or herself with. Again, skin, hair, and nails, especially what we uh, observe as uh, abnormal, not really um, based on patient's baseline, etc. For instance, uh, any any skin rash or eruption, um, unusual hair growth, itching, changing in texture and color, um, sweating, etc. And then musculoskeletal, joint stiffness, pain, restriction of motion. Keep in mind what we said about uh, posture, uh, range of motion here, swelling, uh, any type of uh, redness, etc., etc. Now, we had neck, eyes, visual acuity, blurring, diplopia, which is double vision, uh, photophobia, pain, any type of um, recent changes in vision, ears, hearing loss, pain, discharge, tinnitus, or vertigo, which also could um, be linked to any um, non-biomedical concept, but more, um, more psychiatric um, presentation, um, nose, sense of smell, frequency of cold, obstruction, epistaxis, which is nosebleed, sinus pain, or post-nasal discharge, and throw the mouth, hoarseness or change in voice, uh, frequency of sore throats, bleeding or swelling of gums, recent tooth abscesses or extractions, soreness of tongue or mucosa. All right, let's continue with the second part. We're focusing on the endocrine, genital reproductive system, uh, thorough enlargement or tenderness, heat or cold intolerance, unexplained weight change, uh, polyuria, which is uh, the production of, of, of an abnormally large amount of urine. Um, and keep in mind that this uh, is one symptom of diabetes and, you know, related to this polydipsia, which is a constant excessive drinking as a result of thirst, uh, of course, and changes, again, distribution of facial hair. Now, uh, there are some basic differences between males and females. In the first case, puberty onset, difficulty with erections, testicular pain, libido and infertility. Again, some of those components uh, could be uh, iatrogenic, so caused by medical intervention, especially in the context of medication, and even more so uh, in the context of psychiatric medication, or can be related to psychological disorders as well, or a combination of both. Um, in females, menses, onset, regularity, duration, and amount, um, dysmenorrhea, last menstrual period, frequency of intercourse, age and menopause, pregnancies, and again, within pregnancies, number, possible miscarriages and abortions, which again have um, a, a, um, a possible a negative effect on both medical, in, in the sense of 
um, biomedical components or uh, the combination of this with psychiatry uh, type of delivery. Other complications, consubstantive, um, breast pain, tenderness, discharge, or possible lumps. Uh, chest and lungs, uh, pain related to respiration, dyspnea, cyanosis, wheezing, cough, and sputum, what uh, character and quantity the sputum presents uh, with exposure to tuberculosis, and last, chest x-ray. Finally, <clears throat> for this slide, we have another one coming, heart and blood vessels, chest pain or distress, precipitating causes, timing and duration, relieving factor, again, dyspnea, orthopnea, edema, hypertension, and exercise tolerance. All right, so let's move on to uh, the next slide, uh, part uh, three. So we will talk about uh, gastrointestinal uh, system. So monitor uh, appetite, digestion, food intolerance, dysphagia, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, bowel regularity, change in stool color, very important, or also content, constipation, diarrhea, flatulence, or hemorrhoids, um, genital urinary, dysuria,s flankers, parapubic pain, urgency, frequency, nocturia, um, noctem is Latin for night, so it's this indicates nighttime urination, uh, hematuria, which is uh, blood in urine, uh, polyuria, hesitancy, loss in force of stream, edema, and of course, STD. Uh, Neurological uh, and psychological, um, I just want to mention that those two areas should be uh, included in order to um, focus on our scope of practice. Again, let me restate that, for instance, in the context of nursing, um, we are not expected to perform any diagnostic assessment uh, within especially psychological um, history. We need to provide a further description in order to avoid any possible um, um, misinterpretation of previously obtained data. And at the same time, asking specific questions uh, to the patient, especially in the context of SI and HI, so uh, suicidal ideation and homicidal ideation. But in any case, within neurological thing to, um, th things to consider, syncope, seizures, as well as uh, pseudo-seizures, uh, overall weakness or paralysis, and any type of abnormality of sensation and coordination, so within um, um, sensory motor uh, components, or somatosensory and motor cortex components, uh, tremors, uh, loss of memory, which of course, as uh, the rest overlaps with psychological and psychiatric components, uh, but in any case, uh, having a solid grasp of the patient history. A few examples here, uh, mood changes, depression, whether those things are related or not, as in MDD or major depressive disorder or uh, seasonal affective disorder or in, or in combination with uh, traumatic experience, PTSD, etc and any changes that uh, have to do with, with uh, um, memory, concentration, type of tension, nervousness, irritability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally, pediatric, along with systemic approach, in the case of pediatric, measure anthropometric measurement and neuromuscular assessment. All right, uh, let's continue. Uh, we're talking about assessment techniques. Now, of course, I mentioned previously that uh, in order to better understand each of these techniques, I'll refer to the added material in this module and to the uh, corresponding videos. Now you have four uh, images here, inspecting the abdomen, auscultating the abdomen, palpating the abdomen, and percussing the abdomen. So we have four main elements, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation, which are the four uh, core elements in our physical assessment technique. And then I added telemetry, which is usually not included in a head-to-toe assessment, but of course it provides further um, understanding of uh, specific elements within, uh, within uh, patient vitals and, and, and other um, presentation. All right, um, starting with inspection, what do we mean by inspection? Well, inspection um, is one uh, word that uh, contains this, um, this root, which is to see. Uh, the S P E C T component. Now, of course, the 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 word signifies observing and attending. Okay, we mentioned previously the concept of uh, speculum, as in mirror, right, or spectator. Okay, now we are not just looking up on observing; we are looking within. Okay, so inspection, action of looking within. In other words, 
close and careful visualization of the person as a whole and of each body system. Okay. Now keep in mind um, the uh, the different uh, localization, neurological localization between right and left hemisphere. So it is important to pay attention to the detail, but also to have a broader um, image, right? A broader picture. Ensure good lighting and perform an every encounter with your client or patient. Okay. Now ensure good lighting, of course, to make sure that you are seeing things well. And also um, timing and, and, and number of inspection to make sure that you monitor possible changes. Okay, so direct observation. Next slide, palpation. There are different techniques, especially uh, divided between light and deep uh, palpation techniques, as you can see here in the image below. Uh, what to look for? Uh, temperature, texture, moisture, organ size and location, rigidity or spasticity, crepitation and vibration, position and size, and very, very important presence, possible presence of lumps or masses, tenderness or pain. Now, in this context, of course, you, you understand that there is an interaction between you and the patient. So, um, needless to say, um, palpation techniques have to be performed in the less uh, invasive and most nurturing uh, way possible. Next slide, function. Assess underlying structure for location, size and density of underlying tissue can be direct, indirect as well as blunt percussion all right um percussion part two sound types um some of these things uh, you should remember from uh, the previous class uh, resonance a hollow sound hyper resonance a booming sound uh, timpani musical sound or drum sound uh, dullness and flatness, uh, in the first case, a fat sound produced by dense structures such as the liver and a large spleen or a full bladder, and flatness, an extremely dull sound like that produced by very dense structures such as muscle or bone. Of course, there are different um, um, presentations in each patient. There's a little image here to illustrate this aspect. Now, in the next slide, um, uh, there is a, a brief description of um, Six main elements within uh, percussion sounds uh, characteristics. So, sound itself, the first column, intensity, pitch, length, quality, and example of origin. Okay, um, so you have again resonant, hyper resonant, timpani, dullness, and flatness. You have differences in uh, intensity; can be loud, very loud, or medium or soft. Uh, same thing for pitch. Uh, for length, you have long, moderate, or short. Quality, hollowed, booming, drum-like, thud like or flat. And then within origins, you can have you know, normal lung, uh, lung with emphysema, um, gastric bubble, uh, um, diaphragm, pleural effusion, and then muscle, bone, or thigh. So just uh, familiarize with yourself with these terms and um, address the differences in sound characteristics. In the next slide, we'll talk about auscultation. Now you have two uh, different images here on the right side, and then of course the indication of the stethoscope to skin, so with a bell side and diaphragm side. Now, auscultation, as the name implies, uh, has to do with listening, okay? Auscultare in, uh, in Latin. Listening to sound produced by the body. Uh, in the first figure, uh, there, um, the first figure represents the anterior um, auscultation, and in the second figure, the posterior, so the back. Uh, auscultation. So in, in the first image, you can see here, uh, starting at the top of the chest, first intercostal, intercostal space, use that step ladder approach to listen to breath sounds on the anterior chest, finishing at the seventh intercostal space. So uh, please take a look at the arrows in this uh, step ladder um, approach in this image. Same thing for the back, start at the first interconstant space of the posterior chest, moving downwards, avoiding the scapula to the seventh intercostal space. And again, uh, there will be a video that um, explains uh, these two um, approaches um, more in depth. Instrument, needless to say, stethoscope, um, diaphragm, high pitch sound, hard lungs and abdomen, and bell, low pitch sounds, and blood uh, vessels as a uh, uh, primary area. The last uh, um, element, which again, it's not necessarily part of our physical assessment within nursing or uh, in general, 
is telemetry, okay? Now, the term metry, we already mentioned this, has to do with measure, measuring system, and tele, the same um, roots that you can find in a, a telephone, for instance, means to um, to have a, uh, a a vision in the future, so to speak, a vision that provides more insight in time and space at a, at a distance, right? Um, think uh, within a philosophy, uh, teleological elements, not theological, but teleological elements, okay? So that, uh, that discuss um, broader scopes of, um, of possible um, information we can gather, okay? And that's why it, it doesn't really make sense to call a smartphone a smartphone because that simply indicates uh, a, a, an intelligent sound, okay? You could say that there's a smart telephone, which is a phone that is perceived at a distance. A smartphone as a concept doesn't really make any sense. In any case, as far as telemetry, uh, telemetry indicates an observation tool that allows the continuous monitoring of ECG, respiratory rate, and or oxygen saturation, right? So electrocardiogram, uh, respiratory rate and oxygen saturation. While the patient remains active, e.g. for instance, without restriction of being attached to a bad psychardic monitor, while automatically transmitting for <clears throat> information to a central monitor. Again, something added, uh, sometimes as a uh, further um, computer-based analysis to our uh, physical assessment, uh, sometime provided as an ulterior um, information um, gathering assessment that supports the previous four. All right, um, general survey, okay, within the physical health exam, appearance, behavior, and cognition. Some of these elements we already uh, mentioned. Appearance, uh, patient's age, uh, skin color, uh, facial features, body structure, stature, nutrition, uh, posture, position, and symmetry. Um, and of course, especially within, you know, you know statutory and posture, you have to think baseline element as well. Mobility, gait, if you remember, we talked about gait when we talked about uh, patient vitals as the, as the added uh, patient uh, vital uh, information and ROM or range of motion. Behavior, uh, facial expression, mood affect, speech, dress, hygiene. So overall presentation is also part of behavior. Cognition, level of consciousness, and orientation for include any signs of distress, facial grimacing, and breathing problems. Now, um, aside from the very last one, so um, something that should be connected to uh, uh, certain uh, theories and, and approaches within clinical psychology or uh, developmental psychology and psychopathology, uh, for instance, um, um, Paul Ekman's model, the, the universal facial expression, which we will encounter again to some extent when we talk about pain. Um, appearance, behavior, and cognitions are by definition empirical factor, factor we can observe. Now, of course, within uh, clinical psychology in the West, particularly mm -hmm. in the United States, we tend to have a behavioral or behavioristic approach overall, and that is um, predicted upon the way we utilize psychotherapy, which is for the most part, based on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and DBT, dialectic behavioral therapy. But um, these three elements uh, offer a more direct um, approach within our physical health examination because it is something that we can observe. It's very empirical, okay? Now, of course, all these three elements can be connected and can be connected both from the perspective of uh, any um, correlation uh, type of factor, or they might even have some causal factors, um, so they're mutually um, uh, corresponding uh, within within physical and psychological. Um, and All right, um, we'll switch gears a little bit because when we talked about our assessment, we should also talk about the way we will share what we observe in patients, and this has to do with documentation, right? Um, a lot of things uh, have changed in the last 15, 20 years, particularly in the context of, of electronic health records. But this will provide a general overview. Healthcare documentation provides scientific objective evidence in order to check for possible individual bias. Okay? Um, a bias that can be connected to the, the individuality of the person assessing the patient, but also bias that might be 
related to the very profession and scope of practice that this uh, healthcare provider um, utilizes. So, um, to give you a broad example, um, in the con concept of physical health assessment, we might be more prone to interpret data as mainly physical problems if we come from a perspective of general medicine. And we might interpret things as somatized factors if we come more from a psychological perspective. Okay? Among its functions and purpose, this type of documentation a provides a chronological source of client assessment data and a progressive record of assessment findings outline the client's course of care. B ensures that information about the client and family is easily accessible to members of the healthcare team, provides a vehicle for communication, and prevents fragmentation, repetition, and delays in carrying out the plan of care. Okay? So we have clinical notes, uh, we have HMP, uh, we have sticky notes, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, C establishes a basis for screening or validation proposed diagnosis. This is connected to what we said earlier to make sure that there is a consistency of observation. And finally, D acts as a source of information to help diagnose new problems. Okay? Part two, documentation also offers a basis for determining the educational needs of the client, family, and significant others. In this context, I should mention that each uh, state, at least within the US, has a different set of rules and regulation when it comes to, uh, for instance, um, advanced directives, okay, for, for instance, for palliative care or end of life care. So it's important to familiarize uh, oneself with these differences. Uh, provides a basis for determining eligibility for care and reimbursement. This has to do with healthcare system, insurance policies, etc. Uh, careful recording of data can support financial reimbursement or gain additional reimbursement for transitional or skilled care needed by the client. Now, as you can imagine, this can be um, a um, controversial area because, for instance, again, in, in especially in um, in psychiatric disorders, uh, we might find ourselves as healthcare providers uh, split between the overall presentation of our patients and the level of information provided in our notes. Now, this does not mean, should never ever mean that we should edit our notes to reflect a certain intent, okay? Um, a, a second case scenario. But for instance, uh, it is also true that um, in the case of uh, um, psychosis or schizophrenia on one side in which the patient might not be ready for discharge this in itself constitutes more of a leverage to prove to the um to an insurance company that indeed the patient should have the opportunity to stay longer in an inpatient psychiatry unit okay something that's much more difficult to assess from an ethical standpoint is suicidality because the patient might feel an extra pressure to display certain behavioral modalities uh, in fear that if, if they feel healthier, better too soon, that they might not be um, able to stay longer uh, in an inpatient psychiatric unit, okay? This, of course, is not necessarily the case, um, but it's something to, uh, to navigate with our patients and in, 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 a, um, in, in a broad uh, sense of the term, with inclusion of multiple treatment team members, to verify what we can do to support them, all right? All right, let's two uh, um, elements here. Documentation constitutes a permanent legal record of the care that was or was not given to the client. So this uh, also serves the purpose of providing support for the providers and for the client, for the patient, to make sure that uh, the client receives the best possible care. And finally, documentation provides access to significant epidemiologic data for future investigation, research, and educational endeavors. All right, so um, it's very important because we, uh, we, uh, as healthcare provider within medicine, we uh, work in a field that combines um, technology, uh, research, uh, arts, and uh, epistemological aspects. And so the more we practice, the better we get at our clinical intervention. So it's really important to 
to um, pay special attention to this aspect of documentation that might be um, going beyond the, the, the single approach to each client because documentation can also serve the purpose of uh, quality improvement, as we will see when we talk about research, um, in the absence of patient identifiers. All right, so um, use phrases instead of sentences to record data. Um, and this has to do with, again, making sure that we are as objective and detailed without being redundant as possible. Uh, record data findings, not how they were obtained, okay? So as objective as possible. And this is kind of redundant, but write entries objectively without making premature judgments or diagnosis. Um, now, even though we might be very aware of these aspects, it is really important to navigate the complexities of the words utilized because we don't want to imply certain things. So whatever we write has to be reflected um, in our direct um, assessment. In other words, this means that um, if it's not written, it did not happen. And if it is written, it did happen. Okay, when, it talks, when we talk about behaviors, especially. Okay, so this is very uh, one more um, area within documentation, um, recorded clients' understanding and perception of problems. This is especially important uh, when we are uh, administering medications, when we are um, performing our clinical assessment and monitoring patient vitals, um, as well, especially um, in the context of combination of psychiatry and, psych and, uh, and, and medical disorders, to make sure that the client has or patient has a clear Avoid recording the word normal for normal findings. And this is a variety of um, um, possible reason repercussions and, and things to keep in mind because um, the term normal aside, or sorry, outside from a uh, um, medical, epidemiological, mathematical, and statistical area can imply certain um, socially constructed expectation, particularly in the context of uh, psychological disorders. So we might think of, of um, other ways to, uh, to um, verbally describe um, the baseline uh, presentation of our patients. Um, record complete information and details for all client symptoms or experiences, okay? to make sure that we don't uh, forget about this or that aspect in our clinical assessment. Include additional assessment content when applicable, okay? So uh, it is important to go back to our notes, uh, add um, other SOAP notes, et cetera, et cetera. Completing the assessment uh, if we feel that something is missing. And finally, support objective data with specific observation obtained during the physical examination. Wonderful. Now, we will talk in this um, next area about assessment tools and indexes. Now, there's a lot of them, and uh, for the sake of time in this lecture, I will limit um, the number of assessment tools down to only four or five, um, also because the main area of discussion this week is physical assessment. So I just want to provide some examples here um, that uh, we should start familiarized with. The first one is the II or Index of Independence in Activities of Daily Living or ADL. So what are ADLs? These activities are activities performed as part of normal baseline daily living. Okay? They include self-care, such as feeding ourselves, bathing, dressing, grooming, but it also include work, homemaking, and leisure. So uh, right here we have an image of uh, multiple areas within daily living activities, starting with the yellow, health practices, uh, household stability, communication, safety, uh, managing time, nutrition, relationships, alcohol and drug use, uh, sexual health and behavior, and personal care and hygiene. Okay. Now, of course, um, it remains um, in the, in the um, skill areas of each healthcare provider to make sure we ask questions that pertain to our care, not out of curiosity, because of course, um, th this will, will go against the ethical uh, recommendation for our profession. So every question supposed to have a direct link to our therapeutic intervention. The next area, the Barthel Index um, consists of 10 items that measure the individual's activity of daily living and mobility, daily functioning, and within this um, assessment uh, index, uh, you have feeding, moving from wheelchair to bed and return, grooming, transferring to and from a toilet, 
bathing, walking on level surface, going up and down stairs, dressing, and then the last element is content of bowels and bladder. Now, within this index, you have, uh, as in the next slide and the following one, uh, <clears throat> certain scores that you can um, uh, rate each area. For instance, feeding, the first one, zero means unable uh, to feed oneself, five needs help cutting, spring butter, etc., requires modified diet, and 10 means fully independent. Okay? So you see that those are numbers that we can uh, associate um, to the uh, patient presentation in order to have a um, better way to monitor changes, for instance, and to make sure that we are not um, missing any important information. This is one list of um, activities and in the next slide. Okay? For a total of a zero hundred uh, point maximum. Okay? Wonderful. Um, to continue, uh, another assessment tool is a uh, or index is an acronym, Socrates, like the, the Greek philosopher par excellence. So uh, within pain assessment, again, this does not necessarily um, um, represent a core um, part of the overall physical assessment, but it's really, really important to be uh, familiar with, with um, at least the, the, the presence of different types of pain assessment. So Socrates stands for S-O-C-R-A-T-E-S, -E so sight, meaning where is the pain? Okay, this is a question that we have to ask both our patients as well as ourselves in terms of make sure that we have a um, solid grasp of the area uh, affected. Onset, when did the pain start? Uh, was it sudden or gradual? Character, what is the pain like? Okay, so um, this is a qualitative analysis that, uh, that plays a major role um, in, in this um, area of our intervention. Radiation, does the pain radiate anywhere or is it localized to a specific area? Association, any other signs or symptoms associated with the pain, whether physical or psychological. Time course, does the pain follow any pattern? More in the morning, less in the evening, for instance, etc., etc. After medications, before or after a meal, etc. Exacerbating relieving factor, does anything change the pain? Okay, not just uh, pharmacological intervention, but for instance, laying down or um, eating, for instance, or uh, or drinking, etc. And finally, as for severity, how bad is the pain? And we want to rely on our patient's feedback. Okay? There are other pain assessments. There are many. I only mentioned three here. The one of the most famous one, probably the most famous, is in the West, is the McGill uh, Pain Questionnaire or MPQ. And then the Juan Baker Faces Pain Scale. We are all very familiar with with this one. Now, this could lead to possible bias and misinterpretation, but it has the benefit of not necessarily being fully um, uh, based on um, semantic or cultural factor, but only on facial expression are easy uh, or easier detected, um, especially in the context of um, a diverse population. And of course, verbal or numerical pain scales that we need to previously, of course, uh, describe to our patients. Um, another um, index, another tool we can utilize, and it's the last one for, for this um, slideshow, uh, Gordon's functional health patterns. The client's strength, talents, and functional health patterns are an integral part of the assessment data. An assessment of functional health focuses on client's normal function and his or her alter function or risk for alter function. All right. Health management pattern, nutritional metabolic pattern, elimination pattern, activity exercise pattern, sleep rest pattern, cognitive perceptual pattern, self-perception concept, role relationship, sexual reproductive, coping stress tolerance pattern, and value belief pattern. Okay, So this is another um, area of uh, assessment that could provide further insight uh, to our uh, patients. We are approaching part two of this lecture Integrative, complementary, and alternative healthcare uh, part two. We'll continue our conversation uh, started last. So, a uh, few basic premises um, in connection to mind body medicine. Okay, mind body medicine as an area within integrative, complementary, and alternative healthcare. MBM can be considered an interdisciplinary field at the intersection of general medicine and psychology, but also ethnomedicine and anthropological medicine and or 
folk medicine, ethnopharmacology, epidemiology, sociology, physiology, endocrinology, and under combined fields such as psychoneuroimmunology. Now, you might argue, well, aren't those areas already included in evidence-based medicine anyway, Western uh, biomedical uh, models? And the answer is absolutely yes, but it's also uh, in part due to the work conducted in many, many uh, years, decades of research within mind-body medicine. So this integrated holistic approach that uh, provided a much better way to understand the complexity of this interaction between mind and body, between nature and nurture, as this uh, image right next to it suggests. So similar to what we said earlier about the uh, complexities of our assessment, also in relation to the concept of a wheel of health with multiple areas of intervention that have connection to ADLs, as we've just seen um, in a few slides ago, you have different elements here. So uh, physical health, emotional, environmental, financial aspect, occupational aspect, social aspect, intellectual aspect, spiritual aspect, etc., etc. Now, um, within mind-body medicine, the assumption is that we as human beings are not just our bodies, or better said, that the model, the body as a machine, has its limitation. It's a very effective model, similar to uh, the way we utilize, for instance, uh, Newtonian physics to, um, to achieve the best possible descriptive um, um, apparatus for um, the categorization of uh, elements in this world, right? But um, to understand the complexity of, of human beings and also to provide a, a, an appropriate uh, care that takes into account all this aspect, um, the assumption that mind and body are at least two different areas, two different aspects of a continuum, of a unicum, it's usually um, a very good approach. Now, um, in this uh, lecture, I will also, uh, I will only mention a few aspects. So, some of the assessment tools utilized from the perspective of mind-body um, contain uh, a, a qualitative analysis. This is just one example, narrative medicine, that is um, a, um, both a therapeutic um, session as well as an assessment tool we utilize um, um, on the unit. Um, and this is an example of what narrative medicine is. Now, narrative medicine contains some elements that are similar to narrative therapy, okay? Which is a model utilized, um, an integrated model utilized in, in, in psychology and psychotherapy. But narrative medicine um, is a specific model that was developed uh, in Milan, in, in Northern Italy, uh, as well as in um, other European countries, uh, in Belgium, France, uh, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, etc., etc with the purpose of serving both uh, sides of the spectrum, so both patients and providers, to teach providers to take better notes, to uh, provide a better clinical assessment, both physical and psychological, and to allow uh, the patients to have a better grasp of the time frame and all um, um, factors uh, involved in the way there are presenting and in the way the their healing path is proceeding. So this is a very uh, long um, um, assessment model that you can find in, in the textbook. But in this slide, I only um, quoted some elements. So my story before the illness, then something happened to me after that things or some things were not like before and then now tomorrow and writing my story. Now, those are all sentence starters, okay? And on the right side, you can see a, a diagram here with, uh, with um, added um, elements. So it happened like this, I was dot, 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 when I felt something, dot, dot, dot. And so the idea is that the patient is writing the, uh, you know, his or her story as a way to possess, to have control over their um, healing path. Now, if the story has to do with a clinical evaluation, in the words, medical history, with the story of a physical disease. This provides a lot of insight to make sure that we understand where the problem started. So keep in mind, for instance, that the Socrates uh, uh, pain scale, it's very important to understand 
the the mechanism, the processes involved in the um, the development of a physical problem. But even more so, when the physical problem might be um, an, an underlying mechanism connected to psychological factors. Okay, now um, narrative medicine um, models are uh, customized depending on the needs of the patient. So, for instance. Um, there are a few few words here. The illness dot 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 or the center of this diagram can be substituted for the problem, the issue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Um, and um, and and then there are other areas. For instance, at home I can da 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 or I cannot da 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 when I'm not at home. This can also be uh, customized in the case of a patient coming to us to a clinic uh, from another healthcare um, situation, another clinic, another hospital, or a, 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 a shelter, or, or, or a, um, assisted living facility, etc., etc. So the idea here is that we should provide our patient with a better insight and a better control over their uh, healing uh, process, because this helps the process itself, and it also is useful from an ethical standpoint to make sure that the patient uh, is uh, understanding our approach. All right, the next slide, slide 43, is an, yet another example uh, of an assessment tool. This is the tree diagram, okay? And this is a, um, a um, psychological approach, uh, mind-body medicine approach, uh, utilized within um, behavioral cognitive factor as well as life skill factors. Um, and there's only one question that uh, is related to this diagram how do i see myself and others okay now this is technically not a clinical assessment per se in other words we don't infer any uh, diagnostic component when the uh, patient or client describes how they see themselves looking at this tree diagram there are a lot of things though that can be interpreted in cooperation with the patient for instance Am I seeing just one three? And are those branches uh, symbolizing different aspects of who I am, uh, my, my work, my, um, my home situation, my dreams? Or are these two different, two separate or connected tree that, um, that symbolize, for instance, the relationship I have with my children, with my partner, or uh, the relationship that my current self a cell that might be physically impaired due to an injury has with my old self that was not suffering physically or otherwise as I am now. Or to ask of myself like when I was suffering from an addiction, for instance, and the current situation where I'm fighting to, uh, to provide a, a, a more balanced lifestyle. So there are a lot of things that can be um, uh, addressed by using this this um, this module. Now, of course, uh, one of the great elements in this type of assessment is the absence of any preconceived notion of either what to answer, how to answer, or any uh, words or descriptors that can be uh, detrimental to uh, the care of. Uh, uh, a diverse population, minorities, or in the case of language barriers, for instance, it's an image. Okay? And the question is very, very open. It's not the only one, it's the primary one in this, in this assessment. And it's, it's a question that uh, can also serve the purpose of a conversation start, an icebreaker, to also provide a better chance to develop patient-provider um, uh, nurturing and professional uh, rapport. Wonderful. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. These two uh, slides, the last two slides in this sector, um, are simply a brief list of uh, complementary and alternative medicine examples in an alphabetical order that does not signify any uh, judgment of value or uh, if efficiency, effectiveness, these three main areas of clinical um, studies, or any medical recommendation, right? Uh, to find out more about each of these um, complementary, alternative, and integrative approaches, please refer to the textbook as well as to the uh, reference within the, within the textbook and the module. 
So we have acupuncture um, that is connected to traditional Chinese medicine um, and uh, other practices like um, TTM and our um, discussion of Ayurveda in, in, in uh, the first class, the first uh, week of this course. Anthroposophic medicine connected to the work um, of uh, Rudolf Steiner and of course to uh, the pedagogical approach within Waller School, uh, biodynamic uh, agriculture and so on and so forth. Aromatherapy that uh, it's um, pretty self-explanatory. Art therapy, we talked about that last week. Ayurvedic medicine, which is the system that we discussed in week one, connected to the Indian subcontinent and to that um, geocultural area. Uh, biofeedback, bioenergetics, bioenergetic therapy, and vegetal therapy. We discussed this previously. Um, if you have any questions in this regard, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, chiropractic medicine, um, if you remember our discussion um, in uh, regarding the, uh, the historical division between uh, chiropractic medicine and osteopathic medicine and the subfield as osteopathy or manual osteopathy and uh, the connection to the scope of practice licensing areas and intervention okay you remember the term uh, chiro or hero is related to the greek term for hands so manual practice the next one um, i included these three main areas uh, now, of course, uh, within the letter C, Christian faith healing, but of course, uh, the, the term itself has a different connotation in the United States as opposed to um, elsewhere abroad and also in connection to different types of healing. For instance, uh, we should not include in this modality uh, Islamic medicine, for example, Jewish uh, traditional medicine, okay? Um, but this is an area where uh, the connection between uh, transcendental factors and and, and, and ritualistic practice, we could say, play a role in the way uh, the medical practices are, first of all, understood and uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, applied. Um, this, again, does not represent an endorsement necessarily of this, particularly in, 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 um, in those areas that are more connected to certain theological or philosophical understanding, but it's important to understand that at least those things are present and we might need to uh, navigate further the connection between these practices and our uh, patient's approach or the patient's family approach uh, in order to also understand um, their um, ethical uh, um, and, and, uh, and um, system of beliefs and values when we provide care. DMT, dance movement therapy, uh, similar to what we said about music therapy and art therapy, there are specific um, uh, accreditation um, institutions, uh, registrations, certifications, and licensing approach that uh, you can find um, in the textbook um, if you're interested in this field. Deep breathing exercises, energy medicine, which is connected in itself with uh, concepts such as qi, spelled either C-H-I or Q-I, with the principle of vitalism, right, or vitalism from vita, right, Latin for life, okay? So the idea that we have an energy source in our body, connected also to yoga therapy that we discussed last week. Ethnomedicine, folk medicine, traditional medicine, are these terms the same or not? Well, I just want to briefly mention here that the term folk is actually a Germanic term that is equivalent to the populus, okay, which is the people in Latin, okay? Now, of course, in English, saying popular medicine and folk or folklore medicine have a very different um, ways to be understood in the general population. But by folk medicine, in this context, we mean connected to a specific tradition, okay? That might or might not be related to an ethno-cultural or an ethno-religious group, okay? Now, traditional medicine, we mentioned this before, the tradition of American US-based medicine is of course a modern tradition that stands from um, from Europe in the in the in the um, transition between uh, um, Enlightenment ideas, French Revolution, Industrial Revolution in Italy and, and, and in England. But overall, it's it's a shorter tradition in comparison to big traditions such as traditional European medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and so on and so forth. Guided imagery, we talk about this in the context of uh, um, mind-body medicine within psychotherapy, okay? Herbal medicine and phytotherapy or spagyrics. The term phytotherapy really is a substitute for herbal medicine 
This does not necessarily mean that a phytotherapy practitioner is licensed or registered or certified as an um, uh, expert in herbal medicine or practitioner of herbal medicine, but phytos indicates plant-based medicine um, in, uh, in, 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 in Greek, okay? So um, in German, you have the term Pflanzenkunde, for instance, to define this type of approach. Uh, spagyrics or spagyrics is the so-called green alchemy that we briefly discussed. So another uh, element of traditional medicine um, stemming from the uh, Greek or Roman world in connection to what we said about um, Unani medicine and um, uh, hermetic uh, traditions in, in uh, North Africa and Egypt specifically. Hypnosis and hypnotherapy utilize both for the perspective of pain reduction in terms of the current studies. One of the most uh, effective ways to uh, utilize hypnotherapy is for uh, pain management, for instance, uh, during labor and delivery. Okay, And as I mentioned previously, hypnosis should be viewed, uh, at least from a cognitive standpoint, as an advanced, uh, more in-depth, more profound uh, uh, meditative practice okay now whether a person can self-hypnotize or not this of course is um, is a controversial area uh within the theoretical approaches because there are uh, scientists who believe that yeah, the individuals that are indeed hypnotized are consciously playing a role okay and so that the whole idea of being more prone to be hypnotized um there's a further investigation on conceptualization of self okay but in any case um it's one of the areas in which mind-body medicine can be extremely useful, for instance, in the context of previous um, opioid addiction. Okay? Homeopathy, we mentioned uh, this field and the, and the, and the work uh, by uh, Samuel Hahnemann. Um, uh, homotoxicology, we already talked about this previously. Magnetic healing, this is connected to, again, vitalism or vitalism on one side, and mesmerism or animal magnetism, the term mesmerism from which uh, our modern um, adjective to be mesmerized, okay, um, sends from Franz Anton Mesmer, um, a, um, a, an, an Austrian physician that uh, developed this, uh, this technique. And then we will continue with massage therapy. Uh, then again, um, has different has different ways to be uh, utilized, whether um, in the context of a registered massage therapist, as opposed to massage in combination to uh, in combination with um, osteopathic and chiropractic medicine. Meditation and mindfulness very often utilized uh, both for the psychological um, treatment perspective as well from pain reduction, etc., etc. Mind body medicine as a term could be really applied to all of this and that's why i i, I included this um, this list in this section but of course the idea here and the assumption is that there are at least two things one is the mind and one is the body so those things are not the same okay so you could, you could argue that this would be an indication for philosophical dualism so a separation between these two but again another thing to keep in mind is that if those two things are indeed separate, uh, well, how can we quantify them? Is the body our physical body and is our body to be perceived as a machine, a mechanism? And is our mind synonymous with uh, psychological processes or more transcendental aspects such as in a spirit or a soul? And even if we quantify this, we have to decide which one has a prevalence. In other words, whether it's we are more on the idealistic um, spectrum in which we have mind over matter or the opposite where we more um, we focus on a matter over um, over mind or we are neutral monism there's a third factor beyond mind and body but in any case mind body medicine in short is a type of medicine that considers more aspect than just a physical body Music therapy, we talked about this before. Narrative medicine, we just uh, viewed uh, an assessment. Naturopathy, Heilkunde, Heilpraktiker, Naturarzt are different terms utilized uh, in the German speaking or the Germanic speaking world, I should say. Uh, naturopathy, of course, has to do with the work by uh, Benedict Lust, so uh, German, Germanic heritage um, uh, that was um, 
very much a primary influence once he moved to the United States for the development of this field. And naturopathy can be um, interpreted, if you remember, as either uh, the feeling, the, the connection, um, the, the approach, the sensation, the manifestation of nature, as in pathos, right? Or, which is a Greek term, okay, connected to the, the Latin passio, passion, or naturopathy as a path toward nature, the path within nature, which will be the English equivalent, okay? The term heilkunde means really a healing, um, uh, healing field, healing technique, healing subject, etc., healing practice. So um, you could say that the, the, the term high practitioner is a practitioner of this type of natural healing. And so in, in, in this context, uh, there, are, uh, there are differences in um, uh, legislative areas. And so in, in, uh, in each country, the, 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 the law states different things in terms of what is the figure of a uh, um, natural path or a naturarzt, the term naturarzt, in, in German uh, indicates a natural physician, not necessarily a natural doctor, okay? But in any case, naturopathy is connected to traditional European medicine. You can see it right next to it, TEM, okay? Then we have osteopathy, manipulative medicine, Feldenkrais me method, and Alexander technique with different uh, origins from, from Israel to uh, the United States to Europe, okay? The, the, the idea is that there is a manipulation where money of course indicates hand in latin okay so um, it might involve realignment uh, re reassignment um, massage therapy etc etc there are very different uh, approaches especially different between final christ method and alexander technique but it's important to understand that those are indeed part of a, a more holistic approach to medicine let's finish with the last column pranotherapy therapeutic and healing touch of course this can be more controversial for the at least perceived absence of um, valid uh, evidence-based method to investigate these practices. Uh, the term prana, I will encourage you to um, to um, research it further. It's a Sanskrit term that, again, is connected to what we said earlier about is uh, vita, these chi uh, principles. Progressive relaxation, qigong, reiki, tai chi chuan, which in this last um, example is considered a martial art but a healing martial arts okay where martial should not be necessarily considered only from the perspective of offense and attack or or self-defense sports practice but martial in the etymological sense of the term so martial comes from mars which has nothing to do with the planet or only in in, in a further relation but it has to do with the god mars the god of war the god of defense in the italic italian roman tradition okay the last three here, TCM, TM, and TTM, as the acronym implies, they define very specific uh, sociocultural, ethnocultural areas. Although, as you can imagine, there are uh, big differences within traditional medicine. For instance, uh, the, the Chinese Han tradition is quite different from the Uyghur tradition uh, uh, that is closer to the Unani tradition itself and the Islamic tradition. Uh, within Tibetan medicine, of course, there is this interaction between the world of Ayurveda on one side and the world of, of, of uh, traditional Chinese medicine per se on the other side. Wilderness therapy, very, very much in use uh, throughout the spectrum of um, healthcare and involving, you know, more connection with nature. And then yoga, which we discussed last week, that can be viewed either from a sociological anthropology perspective as a cultural factor, as well as providing um, clinical assessment modalities. Let's finish strong, part three, clinical research. Uh, this is a, a course in you know, healthcare and medicine in general. So of course, uh, we will not have the chance to uh, discuss uh, the specifics of uh, um, biostatistics and epidemiology, but at least I would like students to be uh, familiar with basic concepts within uh, clinical research uh, for one main reason. Uh, and the reason is to be able to navigate the complexity of medical sciences and understand where to find proper sources slash resources, uh, especially toward your uh, final project, but also for a further understanding of uh, what you might need at some point, either as a practitioner, as well as a uh, person who might be at some point a patient to understand how to um, 
achieve a better understanding of uh, current scientific evidence. All right, so medical science sources and methods part one. Uh, some of the most common research study types include, which again means that this is not a comprehensive list, okay? You won't find everything here. Also, I did not um, discuss um, or I did not describe these um, study types in a specific order, okay? So for that, I will refer you back to the pyramid of scientific evidence we discussed um, in week number one. But again, two main things to keep in mind. The first one is that there are qualitative and quantitative studies, okay? Both extremely important. One focus more on the uh, number-based uh, approach, quantities, measurability, okay, in terms of uh, encoded um, uh, numerical data okay, or statistical uh, data, including, you know, uh, mean, median, and percentages, and, and, and ratio, and, 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 and risk factors, and and, um, and, um, and points and, and tables, and qualitative data that, of course, have to be further translated, transmitted, transferred into um, scales to have a better grasp, but they, they usually are uh, two modalities that represent a whole. So the ideas, the general approach will be qualitative and the boiled down, filtered element in quantitative analysis. So you have ideas, editorials, and opinion that could start a conversation. You have case reports and series. You have case control studies, okay? One of the most important uh, area of scientific investigation. Cohort studies, prospective observation studies. RCTs, uh, again, you probably heard me mentioning the, uh, this, this acronym several times. Now, within RCTs, we had to think about double-blind uh, factor or triple blind factor as well to avoid possible bias. Uh, meta analysis and systematic reviews, okay, that combine studies uh, over the course sometimes of, of, of years and decades. Uh, cost benefit analysis and quality improvement studies that might not necessarily have a direct impact on the therapeutic or pharmacological intervention itself but have a broader scope of intervention uh, in the context of providing care, um, longitudinally speaking, in a healthcare facility, in a healthcare setting, for instance. Now, studies aside, um, another important factor to uh, keep in mind to better grasp um, current scientific evidence is where to find it. And that's what we're gonna talk next. When conducting research and verifying the current scientific evidence in the most recently published literature, it is very important to rely on accurate, informed, and valid sources. Now, um, the, the way we should approach medical science is being professional, being well-informed, and also maintain a healthy skepticism, as we will see in the next few slides. Now, the first reliable scientific source I included here, and those, by the way, are scientific sources in English, okay? It, this is a very important factor because sometimes we have the tendency to think that uh, unless something is published in English, uh, we, we, we might not have enough um, control of the validity of the site because we, you, you, you shouldn't rely on, uh, on, um, on, 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 on translations that are not uh, uh, predicted upon a, a solid understanding of medicine, okay? Um, and so not everything that is in medical science, um, considered current scientific evidence, can be found in English. But in any case, the first uh, source is medical university libraries and laboratories. I mention this because the big issue is that many people have the tendency to rely on internet digitalized sources as if printed materials are not valid. Well, the internet is a very, very broad area. It's a big, big world. It's a worldwide web, as the name implies. And of course, quantity does not necessarily mean quality. Now, there are obvious benefits of the internet, one of which would be the direct communication uh, and accessibility to studies regardless of where you are in the world. So, uh, especially in current scientific evidence, and by current scientific evidence for um, for uh, um, research and clinical trial, I usually suggest 
uh, students to monitor what happened in the last six, seven years, and this applies to bibliographical references as well. So to find current resources, the internet is a wonderful place, and yet it's a very limiting place because the assumption is that unless something has been processed you know, by a computer, then you're not going to find evidence of that sort. And this is especially true uh, since we just mentioned the importance of an integrative holistic approach to healthcare, a mind-body medicine, an ethnocultural uh, approach, a complementary alternative and integrative approach to medicine. So a lot of information based on this type of approaches cannot be found either in, on, on the internet or even in a printed form or even in English. So this is something just to keep in mind um, because this again has to do with the common concept of um, absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. Okay, so keep that in mind. So a few uh, reliable scientific sources on the internet, uh, researchgate.net, academia.edu, if you want to find um, peer-reviewed uh, papers and um, scientifically valid uh, publications, books, presentations, uh, PowerPoints, etc., etc. Um, nccih.nih.gov, so it's part of the National Institute of Health. These specific links, however, is connected to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health okay, within the NIH, so the more holistic approach where you can find solid scientific evidence. OpenSciences.org that provides both a medical investigation on current uh, scientific literature, but also on sciences in general. Uh, OpenScience.org is also the, the city of the, the post-materialist um, manifesto, so I really encourage students to navigate that website. And then the ECDC, which is the European uh, Center for Disease Control, and the CDC, which is the United States-based uh, Center for Disease Control, um, both governmental um, uh, websites that provide the most current evidence uh, in many, many areas of healthcare. The next slide uh, includes overall good scientific sources, but not necessarily fully scientific peer-reviewed sources. So, um, uh, Google Scholar, it's a good place to start, but I would really encourage students not to limit their search um, in this uh, on this portal, okay, but to navigate further where this publication have been indeed uh, published, delivered, and peer-reviewed. MayoClinic.org is a very famous website that I would say, uh, given the nature of Mayo Clinic, a non-profit clinic provides good information, some of the dangers, uh, not necessarily to this specific um, website, is the possibility for self-diagnosis that unfortunately um, many many people could could encounter. Okay, um, and um, so it, usual usually the resources you can find on Mayo Clinic are, are very solid, very reliable. But again, those are just summaries and overall descriptors, not necessarily. Uh, current scientific evidence published maybe in the last year or so. So just keep that in mind. And then the um, National Board of Medical Examiners, uh, from the perspective of medicine specifically, it's also a good, a good website to keep in mind. Unreliable, unscientific sources, unfortunately, include Google. I would never advise students to Google anything per se, okay? Unless you utilize Google uh, um, or Bing or Yahoo simply to access the website that you know to be uh, scientific, but do not rely on Google data themselves, okay? Because first of all, the acronyms, sorry, the, acronym, the, the, the algorithm utilized are not based on scientific evidence, but on other factors that sometimes have to do more with uh, business marketing models rather than um, scientific of, or, 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 or medical factors, unless you use Google to go to you know, Google Scholar, which is different. Wikipedia, absolutely unreliable and unscientific. Again, it can be utilized to start a conversation, to browse something, to familiarize with certain concept. But again, unless you really scroll down and you click on the original reference from which certain statement have been taken, and so you go and research the original article, I would certainly not advise Wikipedia use to our students. Um, furthermore, this, uh, this link here is the English Wikipedia, and um, you will find a lot of information that, um, um, that are in contradiction with one another. So, for instance, you 
if you see, I don't know, the, the Wikipedia page uh, about, I don't know, a, a certain medical practice uh, in English, the content will be very, very different from what you're going to find in the German uh, page for that, that um, topic or the Italian one or the Russian one or the Arab one or Chinese one. So I will not utilize Wikipedia uh, for anything uh, scientific related. And of course, the bottom of the bottom is social media or sharing platforms. Um, now, you will be able to see this video on the internet, and on top of that, you will be able to access it through YouTube. So, of course, I will not suggest everything that is posted on social media or sharing platforms, such as the one we're using now, now it's unscientific or unreliable. But the likelihood that reliable information can be mixed with very scientific and sometimes anti-scientific conspiratory like materials is very very high so just be mindful of that in your uh, research all right um part four um navigating complexity it is important to learn how to find a balance between healthy skepticism and relying on professional expertise now um, we are living in um, difficult times from the perspective of medical sciences and um, i also want to to talk about that because uh, it is it is fundamental to have a solid grasp of what's out there to uh, to to be informed enough to detect possible misrepresentation of healthcare modalities all right now <clears throat> what do we mean by between healthy skepticism and relying on professional expertise we mean one main thing, the more informed and scientifically ad, um, advanced we are, the better equipped we are to know our cognitive limitations. Nobody can be an expert in every field and therefore we should rely on the professional expertise of individuals, of scientists, of practitioners that are expert in that field. Now, of course, this cannot be um, originating from science itself, but from epistemological understanding of science. So from a philosophical perspective, we can understand what parameters to use to assess how valid a scientific claim is. And this also means healthy skepticism so that we don't fall prey of conspiracy theories in regard to this or that medical modalities. Okay, So in the lack of further proof, we should rely on the information provided by the sources that I just listed. For instance, ECDC and CDC and information gathered, for example, in coursework completed in universities and colleges okay we shouldn't be skeptic to the point of rejection of these modalities okay um this is very important because otherwise if we do this then we will prevent ourselves from accessing materials in a way that will make sense scientifically speaking right however at the same time, healthy skepticism also means to master scientifically based um, areas of investigation, methods, and techniques so that we can verify whether something posted in a reliable source, a portal, an institution, actually does fit the parameters that this institution has been utilizing to provide that level of scientific evidence. So I want to include a note here, a note from a uh, physician and scientist, a medical scientist, um, um, Marsha uh, Angel, uh, who is the first woman to serve as an editor-in-chief of one of the most prestigious uh, medical science peer-reviewed journals, the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, An extremely well-informed uh, physician that uh, is no longer uh, editor-in-chief uh, because of many, many things that happen according to uh, her own um, personal and clinical judgment. Um, and I, if you're interested in, in this aspect, I encourage you to um, research her name more. But this is just a quote from, um, from uh, a note that she, she wrote. Similar conflicts of interest and biases exist in virtually every field of medicine 
particularly those that rely heavily on drugs or devices. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, this is very disheartening, especially because I just asked you to rely on the professional expertise of scientists and physicians and researchers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this does not mean that you took everything at face value, right? Now, of course, you might argue that the policies of this particular journal or, 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 or peer-reviewed research in general uh, might be the problem. So it, the problem is not that the scientific methods are misconstructed or misrepresented. The problem is that they're not applied in a way that it should be from an ethical and economic perspective to guarantee the scientific evidence. So in any case, uh, this is something to keep in mind when we navigate the complexity of current medical science. And this is also something that will be uh, even clearer when we will move on to the next slide. So the general approach that I want students to utilize is a broader philosophically understood approach to healthcare, where we have solid evidence based on decades, centuries, and a millennia of practice, especially in the context of traditional medicine, they have to be matched by current laboratory science. Okay? So this is what we call a translational approach, something that has to be translated, which means two things. One, to translate as in making it more understandable and available, but also translated to match the uh, target. So translational science is the very last topic, just two more slides, and then we'll conclude. So translational science uh, focus on two main research domains, T1 and T2. So T1 indicates the so-called bench to bedside approach, while T2 translates the finding from the lab into social applicability, all right? So we are practicing healthcare in order to achieve a goal. The goal is to help our patient, to help ourselves, to better understand ourselves, okay? More specifically, T1 translates the knowledge of practice of basic sciences. Keep in mind that medicine is not a basic sciences, right? It's not, it's not part of basic sciences. It utilizes basic sciences to apply those sciences, okay? So T1 translates the knowledge of practice of basic sciences into the developments of new therapeutic strategies, both pharmacological and as well as uh, psychotherapeutic, uh, manual therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And T2 translated data collecting clinical trials into clinical practice, okay? So it's very important to focus on statistical evidence, epidemiology, but also the specific characters and characteristics of each patient. Next slide has to do with what we just said, medical philosophy, okay? Which is not necessarily philosophy of medicine, okay? Um, there are sources in your know, textbook that talk about that. So medical philosophy provides an analysis of translational science to create a science that, one, understands its limits and successes and makes sure that whenever the scientific method is applied in evidence-based practice is not compromised by pseudo-scientific claims, okay? And two, it does not close itself up to different forms of cognitive processes possibly lead to different forms of knowledge, especially in realms such as meaning and purpose of life, which are still not completely understood by means of Western empirical science. This is exactly what happened when we talk about the connection between mind and body, when we talk about the importance of being caring and display a careful, nurturing, um, positive uh, attitude in our patients, not just to um, to uh, please the the um, um, I don't know, any type of of of, of, of um, customer satisfaction survey. It's not about that. That is an, an added um, you know possible um, effect of this. But it's because that's exactly what we're doing. All right. So medical philosophy as a way to understand healthcare from a broader scope. 
And this is the last uh, portion of this brief analysis on translational uh, science. This concludes the topics for week six. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time.